Yeah, it's going now. All right, so we are here in the basement in the control. Um, we're here with Zen. Zen, what's your last name? I'm sorry to get that before. Um, well, I'm, my name is Jason, but people call me Zen, so it's just part of the brain for what I've been doing. All right, cool. I dig it. Um, so we're going to have a little discussion here on, I guess, uh, what is the metaverse? Um, because it, it definitely gets into the weeds a little bit in terms of people start liking it to the matrix or something. But uh, I guess in your own words, can you describe for us what is the metaverse? Uh, a metaverse is essentially a portal. That, that would be the, the best way to describe it. Um, a metaverse is a, a collection of rules within one environment. Now, a uh, better question, I think, would be like, what is one metaverse that we're working on or are going to talk about? Because there's going to be so many different metaverses in a very short time. There's already a, a large quantity of metaverses that are available. Can you give us a good example of one? Uh, I think the most commonly known example of a metaverse uh, that I would use would be uh, like Google Earth. That's a digital copy of the actual world. So it's a metaverse that more people are familiar with because it's, it's a moment in time that's more closely uh, similar to something that exists, like reality. Although when you're exploring like uh, Google Earth, the metaverse, you might encounter something that was, is no longer there, and therefore you're actually traveling through the past. Well, it's definitely something that I think people get fascinated with real quickly. I remember even like pre-Google uh, Earth, there was, uh, like my county had like aerial photos of all the farmland and stuff, and like it was just, enthralling to wander around and look at all the same stuff from a different perspective. Um, so I guess, well, like, wh where do you, I guess, see this going in the next couple of years here? Because, like, Google Earth is becoming almost, like, updated almost every year, it seems. Uh, well, Google Earth has made some really smart moves in crowdsourcing the capture of real-world environments and then adding that information to its existing database, its Google Earth copy. Um, so using programs like uh, Photosynth, where you can take existing images that, it, that have been captured in an environment and then overlay them into the Google Earth environment, including the interior locations. It means that when you're exploring in VR a digital copy of the world, you can approach an item and then what you're actually looking at isn't, let's say, a capture done by Google, but a capture done by someone else of that specific item. So kind of uh, there could be like digital graffiti going on of this uh, same space, really, but well, I'm pretty sure in Google Earth they won't be allowing user interface where you can add content to it aside from uh, photo images that improve the existing spots that haven't been captured. Yeah, I think the main concern right now is just like removing images of blurred faces and street signs or numbers. Absolutely. It's building up the 3D models using the image captures that they have and then superimposing them onto existing LiDAR scans to build the, uh, one 3D model as closely matching the actual world. So I guess besides entertainment, do you see any uh, practical use for a lot of this tech? Oh, absolutely. There's tons of practical uses. Everything from uh, tourism and travel, education, therapeutic uses. I think the biggest one is the one that no one really talks about, is telecommunications. How so? Can you elaborate more? Uh, telecommunications covers like a really huge area. Everything from live streaming telepresence with another person in a virtual environment that is a captured environment of a real life location, and both people that are in it are real life people, so eliminating avatars completely. Um, and education is another one that's very not really talked about very much. Being able to create virtual environments where anybody can attend it, and come in and out and choose a class and be able to attend like a virtual university where you have the uh, room scale accessibility of moving around. Well, I guess like Google Cardboard has like uh, uh, classroom kits where they actually like bring kids a whole yeah. like box of Google Cardboard and the phones for them and uh, they, they're able to explore a lot of these locations. Yeah, I've done that for uh, a high school, an elementary school, and the University of Victoria. Cool. So you were uh, spending some time today and, uh, with doing, a, I guess, a 3D model of the space here. Yep. Um, and you have a, it painted on the screen behind you here. I don't know, maybe we can spin around and take a quick tour of it. Yeah, if you'd like. <coughs> I don't really have it set up for anything, but uh, essentially what, what I did was, it was actually quite simple. It's just using simple 360 photography um, to capture each room from the center with one photograph. 
Now this can be done either with a 360 camera or just using an existing camera and an app such as a Google Cardboard camera where you stand in one spot and you rotate in every direction and it captures all of the light points from every point around you and combines it into a 360 image. Now when you rotate that 360 image and look at it from above, you can mark the corners of the room and then convert that 360 image into a 3D model. So when you mark the doorways and mark the distances between the images using a program such as uh, Walkabout Worlds, which is what I used here, it allows you to build up a 3D model of a large space without having to do any Matterport LiDAR scanning. So this means that just anybody with their own phone and 15 minutes of time can build a very rough 3D model of a, a large environment. Whether you want to teleport from place to place or have room scale navigation within it for, let's say, creating a virtual reality game out of your own house. Yeah, I can see this being a really valuable resource for uh, real estate, just trying to like market rooms and uh, a lot of uh, just being able to like yeah be telepresence with uh, um, some simple technology like a smartphone. Well, every single one of these images, you'll notice that the center of each room is a mirror ball. What I did is I took the image that's around you, reversed it, and placed it at the bottom to eliminate the tripod. But they're also geo-positioned mirror balls, which means that they know their position relative to each other and relative to themselves in, on the Earth in space, which means this can be added to Google Earth or any other virtual reality platform based on Earth and put as the inside of one of those three-dimensional buildings in Google Earth. So that when you're roaming around in that particular metaverse, you can enter into and explore a region where before you couldn't because the Google cars have not gone indoors. But now they are crowdsourced. Oh yeah, like they, now they have the backpacks of, uh, like with the, the three-dimensional cameras or the uh, 360 cameras. And like I said, just with your phone rotating around, you have a backpack essentially just in your hand. Uh, I'm terrible at driving this thing with just a mouse, but yeah, I'm just in the washroom right now. So uh, <laughs> everyone who watches the Block Talk channel has seen the basement in some way, but uh, it's very cool to see it in this whole new, yeah, it's this whole new medium, really. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not like you need a traditional VR set for this. Like, uh, but it definitely changes the experience from just being a room that you drag around to suddenly being in a room that you can walk around in. And, and you're, it's very familiar because it's this actual environment. Now it's way more accurate if I were to just use this existing camera and capture, let's say, a 4K 360 video from this very seat. But the neatest feature is that when you have a duplicate of your actual environment and then enter into it in VR, any activities that take place are suddenly augmented reality. So if I put my camera here and captured this in 360 and then added green screen, you know, uh, cats running around, then when I load it up in VR, if I'm sitting in the same spot, then those suddenly are augmented reality gaps. Interesting. I, I know I, I got a, a Gear VR was one of the, uh, my first intro to real like a VR system, and it, it is just your mobile phone and like a, a fancy headset. But the weirdest thing that I discovered with it. Was
uh, if you go to like just the start menu, it uses your phone camera and puts it on your screen. So then I just like walk through my house using my phone camera as my like my vision. It was it's like, actually the beginning of filtration to create augmented reality. And so there are existing apps that use that pass through camera and can add a filter to the world. So in a, a split second, you can filter out the world into let's say black and white or where certain colors are enhanced. Like I can make it so every skin cut tone is suddenly green and then I walk around in VR in my Samsung gear, but it's an AR device and everybody looks like the Hulk. So you can incorporate things like, this is where it gets really interesting. If you look at Snapchat um, or Pokemon Go, the idea where you can hold up your mobile phone and pass over something and it triggers a reaction. Your phone becomes a filter between you and the world. It can pass a QR code and create an animation. It can add something that you catch or put puppy dog faces on the people that you're passing with your camera. But just like a 360 video where the accelerometers measure the motion of your mobile device, you, the same technology exists in the augmented reality platform, but they haven't done the most important feature, which is allowing you to go landscape mode, <laughs> split the screen into two, because then you can take your Pokemon Go or your uh, Snapchat filters and load it into a cardboard viewer, and people can have puppy dog faces as you're walking around. Yeah, as much as the excitement is on VR right now, I, like AR is, I think, really where the future's at. I think the the HoloLens, or the uh, Microsoft's product, they they really capture that well. They're like they have like a table in like the room, and like you're playing Minecraft on like a virtual mini model Minecraft set. Uh, like the, that level of engagement is really still hasn't reached the consumer level yet. No, not even close. <laughs> no. So, uh, what products are you excited about most right now? I see so you got like a Samsung like 360 camera here. But uh, yeah, I'm a. I definitely like using this camera. Although I would highly recommend if you're going to get into the 360 video space, the uh, your minimum resolution is 4K. Um, at this point, non 3D is kind of more consumer friendly for cost. But if you have the budget, definitely go for a 3D camera and try to shoot at 8K resolution. But the file sizes when you're done filming are so significant that you get into like uh, bandwidth issues. So if your internet speed for uploading is too low, it's not worth live streaming because the best you can do is 3K. And if your download capacity is too low, then you're buffering uh, a gig a minute for these video files. Yeah, yeah. So that's why they're making a virtual reality video experiences as apps because people don't mind clicking an app and downloading it over the next hour to watch the video experience. But at this point in time, people don't have tolerance to watch a video buffer uh, just to have a video experience. So these so, worlds are being created and metaverses and portals to allow you to access the content where you're not feeling like you're having to buffer these video experiences. So uh, is there a specific product still though that you're, you're interested in, like a snack on your wish list? Uh, I do like the InstaPro. It's a, an 8K 360 3D camera with built-in ambisonic 360 audio so that you can use positional audio, which is really helpful because when you're creating a virtual reality environment, um, you no longer have the same ability to direct the gaze of the viewer the way you can with traditional video games and film. So you can't force the view of the, the player. Um, so having an auditory cue where you know crickets sound over here to make a person look over there, or you use uh, body language cues to direct gaze, they're a lot more necessary. And uh, I've noticed that directors have the challenge of, of giving up that control that they used to have of the viewer. Um, but the beauty of capturing in this format is that you might have the viewer completely miss an important event behind them. Um, but that's just like real life. That's what makes this virtual reality because more than once I've had something happen behind me and I had no idea because I missed it. Well, this is where like, they get a lot of um, like guys who work in like cinematics with video games and stuff. Like uh, having that sort of like same knowledge base being transferred over now to like a video format just the same cin cinematography is being now transitioned to a different medium. Yeah, and it's terrible. It's unfortunately <laughs> terrible because the standard policy of quick cut scenes, uh, really rough transitions, changing from high to low, place to place, or even the techniques that were used to create immersion in the past, such as like shaky camera or over the shoulder scenes so that you felt like you were part of that scene, they actually take away from VR now. Because when you're in VR and you're watching a screen that's shaking to try to immerse you in it, it actually has the opposite effect. It cancels the immersion and can actually cause nausea. Well, it's only a matter of time before we get like smell-o-vision and a couple other senses and maybe help 
Yeah, the more senses get hijacked, the more immersive the experience. And uh, se- being adding sense to VR is definitely uh, one of them that are coming. Noculus is the project where they use, uh, I believe, uh, vape cartridges, multiple vape cartridges attached to your VR. But I think the one that's the most underappreciated at the moment is haptic feedback. Oh, like wearing a suit that actually like vibrates in certain ways? Uh, I think assisted VR experiences are going to be a lot more trendy in the very near future. So if I put you in VR and there's a T-Rex that comes up to you and licks you, if at that moment in time I touch you with a wet cloth, your reaction is a lot more intense because you've got an extra sensory input. You've got you know, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Well, like just playing the VR in the space here, it's definitely the weirdest thing is when you bump into someone uh, who, who's not in the space. And I know uh, last time I was here, I uh, gave someone an intro, and I held the controllers, and it was a very interesting experience to see him be handed the, uh, the controller like in real life, but then in the game, he's like, oh my god, here's a sword floating at me, and we'll reach out and grab it. Here I'm grabbing now like a physical device. Like To him, like that, that immersion was just like a whole other level. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. Uh, well, the technology opens up that world of experimentation, so only with this technology can you put on goggles and look down and you're a different gender, or your arm is a sword, or you reach out to touch uh, you know, yourself because you're watching a video of yourself in VR, but there's a different person standing there and you actually have the sensation that you're interacting with yourself. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation you can do, waking up in VR. That's why I said, like, this, it's good that it's here and not in my house, because I would probably play it until I fall asleep and then wake up in it. Like, Waking up in VR is a very interesting phenomenon, oh. because your brain immediately assumes that where you were before the dream is false, and where you're waking up is real. So for a few seconds when you wake up in VR, you actually accept the reality with which you're being presented. So are there any uh, things that scare you about, I guess? metaverse and VR and the way the technology is kind of progressing? Absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest things I've noticed is there's a lack of interest in discussing the negative ramifications and trying to mitigate the issues that come with virtual reality immersion. One of the most obvious is epigenetic manipulation. The fact that epigenetics is a field where environments can actually activate or suppress various genes in your body. So the more immersive a virtual environment, the more likely that it can have these epigenetic effects on an individual. So virtual environments can have effects on your genes, and we don't really discuss this, and there's not very much interest in doing research in in this area yet. So you have like PTSD from like playing too realistic of a VR. Absolutely, but you can do things like uh, potentially change the fetus of a baby of a pregnant woman who experiences a high uh, cortisol response to a a fear-based reaction in VR. Um, I, I'll take this opportunity to open up to the room here, guys. If you guys have any questions for uh, that uh, on, yeah. on the metaverse, yeah. Uh, not about like metaverse specifically, but about video in general, 3D video. You say, and I experienced by myself many times when you watch a 3D video, there is a main sense just floats around you, and there is a lot of situation when something happening behind your back which you're losing, because it's not every time I'm watching this 3D video or sitting on this spinning chair, so I cannot physically just turn 360 around me and to follow. What's the problem to prevent just to actually follow and spin a camera and what I always in front of me will see my main action? Because like uh, movie makers knows particularly where it's like my thing going on. And uh, in my VR headset, understand where I'm looking, like where is my front, where is my default front position. What prevents just to make a movie where I should not just constantly looking for correction, just to sit and relax and enjoy my 3D experience? What prevents? I think it comes down like the mindset. Well, it's honestly it's based on the creators. Uh, the people that are making the content are experimenting with it. Um, So you have virtual reality environments where there's something that goes around you to get the viewer to literally spin in a chair and follow around. But that doesn't work very well for people that are sitting in a non-swivel chair. Um, And then I would say based on uh, heat map tracking, which is uh, being able to keep track of what viewers are looking at within a virtual reality environment, uh, what Google has learned and YouTube has learned is that 80 to 90% of VR experiences, the only amount of information that's being absorbed is from the field of view directly in front of you. Most people are watching VR experiences in a static, non-moving chair or on a couch. So putting content in VR directly behind you uh, is not ideal unless your video is described as like, watch this in a swirl chair. 
And most virtual reality games and experiences don't currently allow you to see where your starting position is. And it's quite common to load up a VR experience that allows you to swivel around, but you lose track of where your starting position is, which is really unfortunate in um, systems like PlayStation, where because there's only one camera, if you end up facing completely away from the camera, the camera's like, vision is occluded of your hand controls, and sometimes you can lose tracking on your hand controls. So it is very important to know where your starting position is, but that hasn't really been become a standard yet. It's kind of like uh, Call of Duty. It's like Call of Duty will like grab you and make you watch something, but then in like Half Life, they like, oh, here's like a plane flying across like the, the sky, and then you follow it to a building that just falls down. Well, you feel like you just were lucky enough to see that. Meanwhile, there are all those cues to point you in that direction. Sensory manipulation. It, it literally is just using like the things that magicians use. These techniques for drawing your gaze one place while they're getting something ready to show somewhere else. These are now all starting to apply to VR. Uh, like I was saying earlier, a placebo effect, um, the tricks of like uh, optical illusions, subconscious manipulation, the whole realm that's been fringe for the last 20 years is now going to start getting into the mainstream. The power of belief can now be objectively studied, analyzed, and, and explored using virtual reality technology and the ability to capture real life environments. Cool. Um, any other questions, guys? <clears throat> yeah, just a quick question. So are you uh, uh, looking forward to the Decentraland project? Uh, um, yeah, I'm really excited about I, that. I, and to clarify, are you associated or? or um, I'm not one of the core members. Uh, there's a definitely, they, they started a fantastic project and when I caught wind of it, I just wanted to get involved because I've been working on something quite similar from a different uh, point of view, starting from the user experience. How can I capture and create environments create 3D models and then build them up to create a virtual environment. And when I found that uh, they were building a place where everybody who creates their own plot of land can in interact with each other in this one metaverse, uh, it just seemed like a, a perfect match to use what I already know and have been practicing and merge it with what, what they're doing. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Uh, so for, for usability in Decentraland, and even like with your demo here, where you're in this static space, that's a very static environment. It, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges to adding usability in that space? Um, well, first off, this is such a basic system that when you take like simple pictures, there's no LiDAR scan, nothing is built up as a 3D model. So you definitely have uh, a lot of distortions. and. I would say that just like the early internet, this is just, it's tolerable, but it's not really the, the standard that people are going to expect from crisp, clear experiences in VR, especially after you play virtual reality games. Then you see something like this, and this is just so basic. But it does offer the ability to, to rapidly create the environments. But um, again, there's no motion in it, there's no uh, activity. But that's kind of the benefit of this, is because the ability to create these environments without having all of that interactivity means that the size of the blockchain doesn't have to be as big. So we can solve some of the early problems with a lot of environments with little motion before we start adding complex motion. If I could have created, rather than one of these being an image, being a 360 video with someone like dancing in it, then one of these rooms could be in motion. But the methods for storing that data definitely become a challenge, especially when you transition into like live streams. But that's where you link them. Instead of having the mirror ball being in Decentraland, that mirror ball allows you to link to a 360 video that might be hosted on YouTube or something. So I have a question, and, uh, and this is a discussion I had earlier with David about events. So I want to go to a great event. But uh, when we talk about events, then ad advertising uh, becomes an important issue. You want to be notified of, of the events that you really want to go to. And, and you don't want to be notified of, of the ones that you don't. So on the space of advertising, how, how, how does it uh, work? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think Decentraland has evolved quite that far where it tracks user metrics to know what type of stuff you're interested in and what type of stuff you're not. Um, but I, I kind of imagine that's the direction it's going where you would check off categories that you're interested in and things that you're not interested in. 
and I don't know exactly what the user interface would be and whether it's going to have like tracking controls for your hands and it can bring up a watch and give you the ability to see, you know, get, receive messages or if it'll just be like a message board that appears maybe above you or below you um, to give you uh, telecommunications, whether you're getting a phone call in, a message in, an invite to a room or to an event. Um, that's kind of something that exists now. Right now it's, it's set up for uh, just search, which is really unfortunate. It's very much like the internet and Google's very basic interface of you have to know what you're looking for and use either voice activation or run a search for it. It doesn't operate very cleanly in categorization where you can say, I want to see what music's available, what music is live streaming right now that I can attend in VR, and now I want the door to appear that I go through to take me to that place. But that's where augmented and virtual reality are inevitably at. Um, so, what's your uh, your favorite favorite application that exists today for like VR and AR? Um, that's a really tough question. Um, I, I'm partial to a lot of them. There's there's so many. V time is the most underrated one of all because it doesn't even require VR, although it does get enhanced by VR, and it allows anybody to meet up with other people inside of a virtual environment. And the reason I like that one is because I've captured over 2,000 videos. I've captured every major city and tourist attraction in Canada, coast to coast, in VR 360 format. So when I meet up with other people in V-Time, the environment we're in is one of mine. So I'll be like, oh, I saw a bear the other day. Boop, now there's the bear in front of us. And, oh, it's getting too close to you. Now we're at Niagara Falls. So it's kind of like video chat, but it's done in 360. Yeah. Unfortunately, it only operates with uh, avatar bodies. But uh, I have a program I've worked on on my own that eliminates avatar bodies and includes actual real life people. So full body language integration. One of my favorite is a game called GeoGuessr. So you get dropped somewhere random in Google Maps, and then you're, you're forced to like look around and then figure out where the hell you are in the world with Google Maps. So sometimes they drop you in the middle of the desert and you're like clicking for a while and like, there is nothing here to tell me where I am. Like you are lost in VR. So I, Well for picking games I definitely would have to say Star Trek Bridge Crew. I don't know if everyone here has tried it. But you're on the bridge of the Enterprise, obviously you're in VR, and you're with two or three of your friends. You can see their arms and their hands and they you can hear them and you're interacting with them and you all have a role in the spaceship. So it's like okay the captain is like, Helen, I need you to change heading, you fire missiles, engineer, give me more power. And you and your friends are navigating a starship through virtual space, a meta universe.